speakers. Welcome once again, one and all. A uh, few instructions in the beginning of the session. Those who are joining the session, please enable your audio before you join the session. If you cannot hear now, please leave the meeting and enter the same meeting with the same ID and password. Enable the audio, audio on and then enter. Otherwise, you will not be able to hear. And there might be some Wi-Fi connection problems which might disable you to hear the audio properly. If there is anything like that, please stay in a place where the Wi-Fi connection is better. So uh, two, there are two sessions today. The first session is by Dr. Sally. That is from 9.30 to 10.30. And the session will wind up by 10.20. So today we will have all the questions by 10.20. So we will go uninterrupted during the session. And you can make a note of any questions which you have. And you can put the questions in the chat session only at the end of the session. So that no, the, even the speaker can answer to your session and it is not interrupting the session at all. So please don't put the chat box in the chat box as the session is going on. By 10.20, the session will wind up and 10.20, you can put the questions in the chat box and the speaker will answer your question. I hope this will be fine for all of you. Uh, and uh, today, so let us start with a uh, new beginning. On behalf of the management and IQAC of Christo Jayanti College, I extend a warm welcome to each one of you towards promoting and sustaining excellence in school education. The educational philosophy of Christo Jayanti College deals in the individual academic excellence with holistic development and nurtures a deep concern for the society. This pedagogy focuses on molding individuals into integrated personalities who are not only intellectually competent, but also socially sensitive. Christo Jayanti College is the only educational member institution of the United Nations Academic Impact, UNAI, that has been chosen from India as the SDG hub for sustainable development goal one, no poverty. We are extremely privileged to have Dr. Sally Elizabeth Bertsal as a resource person for today's session on sustainable development goals in school education. Dr. Sally Bertsal is a lecturer in the School of Curriculum and Pedagogy at the Faculty of Education, University of Auckland, New Zealand. Sally Bertsal began her teaching career working in primary and intermediate schools. After 12 years in classrooms, she won a position at a teacher's college teaching undergraduate student teachers how to run science education programs. When the college merged with the local university, Dr. Sally became a senior lecturer and continues to work in science education with undergraduate student teachers, as well as lecturing at postgraduate level. She now also lectures in environmental education at all levels and supervises postgraduate students' research. Dr. Sally's research interests are focused around teaching and learning of contentious issues using science and environmental educational programs. She is particularly interested in exploring ways in which teachers can help their students learn about such issues, appreciate differing viewpoints, take informed actions, and develop science. Her recent research is set in the context of climate change and declining biodiversity. We, have we are extremely privileged to have you with us today, and we are happy to have a person with a lot of experience in the field of sustainable development to, develop, to deliver this session today. We welcome you and request you to take over the session. Okay. Right. Thank you very much for that wonderful welcome. And kia ora koutou from Auckland, New Zealand, Aotearoa. And I've been asked to talk about ways that you can embed sustainable development goals into education. And so I'm going to talk about this and show you some examples from around the world that are best practice about the ways other people are doing it. So in my country, what we do is we start with a whakatauki. It's like a proverb. 
um, helps us focus and think about what we're going to be doing. And this one here talks about the way that a bird that eats the mero owns the forest, the nahiri, but the bird that consumes knowledge owns the world. And I chose this because this particular bird, this keteru, adores mero berries. And the mero berries in this whakotoki represent knowledge and education. So the keteru, or the learners who are educated because they've eaten the berries, are able to make their way more successfully in the world. So what I'm going to talk about today, first of all, is reminding us all why education is so important, because this is why we teach about sustainable development goals. And I've done some recent research about the way that people in New Zealand and Australia are implementing the sustainable development goals into their work. And so I was going to share a little bit of that with you for your interest. And thinking about the ways you embed them, and I've got some examples from New Zealand, and some examples of best practice from around the world to share with you. So I feel that this quote is something that's really key to us as educators. You know, this idea that education means that society can actually address the challenges of the future. It's going to help our learners cope with, you know, what's coming up in their future. And while it's not the whole answer, it is a vital part. And I think this last bit that I have um, bolded is really important. This idea that we need to imagine and create new ways of relating to people and have greater respect for our environment and the way that we are also part of our environment. And you can see this is an old quote. It's, you know, 20 years old, but it's still key today to our work. So why is education so important? And I mean, we've got SDG goal four about quality education. And what I find fascinating is that um, education, as you can see from the previous quote, it's key because if we're going to make informed decisions about how we're going to proceed forward as societies, we need to know about um, the issues that we are facing. You know, we need to know about climate change. We need to know, for example, about the pandemic and ways that we can manage it. But what's really interesting is I'm coming from this from an environmental education point of view, but actually the UN says no. The most important thing in terms of education is that everybody has an education. We need basic education for all. And that actually is the first point in the SDG4 about quality education. And why this is so important is that there's this um, the relationship between the number of years of education that people receive in a society and it's um, the way it flourishes. So for example, if everybody in a society has four to six years of education, what happens is agricultural productivity in that country starts to increase markedly. So you can feed your people um, better. When you have six to eight years of education for everybody, and especially for women, what we see is an improvement in child health and also child education which again is helping society um, flourish. Nine to 12 years of education for everybody, you see industrial productivity increasing as, um, as well. Now, many countries today aim towards um, developing a knowledge economy. This is more complex um, and what it requires is higher education, it requires research um, centers being set up in countries and research being done, and people engaging in lifelong learning. And lifelong learning is one of the goals in our SDG4, lifelong learning for everybody. So what happened with the Rio Declaration in 1992 is the UN called for education needing to be reoriented towards sustainability which, what, which is, oh, I'm sorry, I've mucked it up, just a minute. Hopefully everyone can still see this. 
press the wrong button. What it means is that we need a particular type of education which looks at the way people um, relate to their environment, which we call environmental education, education for sustainability, education for sustainable development. It's got a few different names. Now, this type of education, oh, sorry, first of all, sorry, we're going to look at the people's using um, SDGs. So um, what I was involved with was this study um, where we surveyed environmental educators in Australia and New Zealand. And as you see, it was an online anonymous survey and we got this many responses. Now I know that doesn't seem many to you, but you have to remember that in New Zealand, we only have four and a half million people in the whole country. I think Australia's got about 10 million. So we're much smaller than India. And one of these questions asked them to rank the exploration um, um, of the SDGs in their programs. And these are the results. Now this bar graph here shows each of the 17 SDGs. Probably can't see it particularly well, but it's a mean score. And what it, the shorter the bar graph, the shorter the um, height of the bar, the more that particular um, SDG was implemented and explored in programs. So for New Zealand and Australian educators, this here is the SDG that they use the most in their programs. So you can see we're very much concerned with our, um, our terrestrial environments, our ecosystems on land, and also the second one, our ecosystems in, in, the, um, in the seas, in our waterways. Climate change was the third one that they um, used the most often, followed by the quality of our cities and human settlements. And also quality education for all was fifth out of the 17. The one that was explored the least was ending all poverty. And the one that was the second um, least often used was this one about economic growth. So overall, for New Zealand and Australian educators, in terms of the SDGs, our emphasis is on conservation and preservation of our natural environments, rather than taking a holistic approach. Um, and when, when we're looking at issues, to think about the economic and social aspects and this is really important because they're the type of things that promote systems thinking. So when we think about embedding SDGs into our programs, we need to approach it from a holistic point of view. You can't just say, oh, we're having a lesson today on SDG 15 about terrestrial environments. It's got to be embedded in a whole program. And the other thing is, is that the SDGs, the ones you choose to embed in your program, depends on where you live and what you're studying. And when you design your programs with your SDGs in mind, one of the things you need to think about is this 21st century learning principle. The idea that there's so much knowledge out there that there's no way that any one person can know everything. So what we've got to be able to do now is be able to use the knowledge. We've got to be able to create it so we can do things with it. The approach needs to focus on an issue, something that is set where your learners live in their place so that it's relevant to them and so they, um, it has an effect on their lives. And by setting it in their place, their community, it means they develop an understanding of their interconnectedness to their community, to the, where they live, which encourages that systems type thinking. And we also want critical thinking and reflection skills being developed and all types of learning, not just sitting at desks learning stuff. We also want learning that's going to um, be affective, it's going to involve, involve emotions, it's going to involve your learners' attitudes, and kinesthetic, referring to the idea that we want learners to go out and do things, we want them to go out and get their hands dirty, 
we want them to go and plant trees, for example, or grow plants. And then related to this idea of place is the idea of partnerships. When we're working on SDGs, it's not just the school as one little entity. We're thinking about the school that sits in a community and that community needs to flourish. So we want partnerships with the schools and with their communities. There's particular principles involved in, um, in approaches for teaching these SDGs. The idea, and you've heard me talk about this before, that it's an issue um, and it's relevant to the students so they feel more motivated. They want to go out there and do something about it. This idea that um, when we're studying issues, they're holistic, so you're not just coming upon them from, oh, we're learning it in science or we're learning it in social science. You want to be using all of the subject areas in your curriculum. You want to be using um, science to learn the facts, for example, about climate change, social sciences where you're thinking about how it's affecting people's lives, um, health, how's it affecting their well-being, um, and then being able to use maths and literacy as well to communicate ideas and interpret figures. I mentioned um, learning being affective, and this is where this comes in. You're thinking about your values. Why do you make the decisions you make? Because you're thinking about your values and, um, and how they've developed. And so you reflect on those. And this idea of critical education, this um, being able to reflect on society and why society is structured the way it is. This um, second to last bullet point about being action oriented, where learners go out and they actually think about um, actions they'd like to take to make a change and then go out and do them. And to be able to take action, you've got to be able to think about the future, what you want your school or your community to look like in the future, then be able to think of that action that you're going to take to be able to reach that goal, that, that a vision you have for your future of the future. So now what I wanted to show you was some examples. So here is a New Zealand example. And this is centered in a town in the middle of our North Island called Topo. And this about in the, here, the children are working together to green Taupo. And on the right hand side, you'll see the sustainable development goals that are embedded in this program. We've got quality education, the um, children are working to improve their city, to make it more um, livable, to make it sustainable. Um, and also the terrestrial um, eco, um, ecosystems and the partnerships they've got. Because it's not just um, a secondary school or a primary school, they've got the early childhood centres as well. So we've got very young children, like two-year-olds, right up to near 18-year-olds working together to improve the green spaces around their, their town. So what happens is they adopt a space and they work to restore it. Um, and the learning takes place in that space outside the classroom. And the older children, so this is this idea of leadership, they work with the younger ones and take a tour kind of tainer role. And what I'm going to show you in the next slide is the sort of things they do. And here's a picture of an older child in the tour, the tour kind of tainer role, showing these younger children the plants that they've raised. So this would be part of the restoration project where they would go out and they would um, replant and plant native plants in this area to restore it to what it used to be like. So this is this idea of greening the local community, this idea that if you plant the native plants, the native birds will come back because you are providing food for them and the whole area will be um, um, what it was before um, the trees were cut down or it, it might have been converted to scrub, a scrub area or something like that. They've also got an online classroom for teachers to access and there's all information there about Kiwi conservation. You might have heard about our native bird, our, it's our icon of New Zealand, it's a flightless bird, it's nocturnal. And also more information about birds of Aotearoa New Zealand 
um, there's also information about our particular fungi and plants. And what I'm going to show you now is a little video about the impact that these, this particular program has had on the city of um, Taupo. So um, here we are. Can people see that or do I need to see that? Do I need to share that screen too? Probably need to share that screen as well. Um, um, I'm sorry, um, can people see that screen? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, can I have some indication um, whether people can see the screen or not? Priya, can, excuse me, can people see this? Yes, yes, yes. Dr. Sally, yes, we can see the screen. Thank you very much, I wasn't sure. So um, this here is, is some data from 2019. And you can see the number of hours the students have worked. And um, the number they've planted over 6,000 trees. And they've grown 450 trees. And they've received money. This is this partnership idea from sponsors and funders. And then this is how many schools are involved. And I'm going to play you this little video here about the outcomes. This opportunity has just harbored our need for environmental education and our interest in the environment and like the interaction that the environment has with people. It's about creating a groundswell movement of young people who are excited and committed to making our town greener. You know, a lot of people are still under the impression that, oh, you know, it's nice if we can do something, but we'll get to it later. We're past the point of getting to it later. We're at the point where we should have gotten to it 20 years ago. And if we don't get to it within the next 10, it'll just come back to bite us. I hope to see like some bushy area and some big trees getting really tall and a nice outdoor area to work in. I hope to see more native birds and maybe animals, red plants in the gully. I hope to see like a like a big bush area we can walk through and see all the birds. I like learning nature because you get to plant some more trees and you get some, you get stronger life. Each one of us as partners bring a different strength to the program and um, that's something that our coordinator can call on us for is, um, is our resources and whatever we are experts at. And they all operate at a slightly different speed and different networks and contacts, so perhaps we're all able to reach a slightly different audience in a different way. It's such a stronger program and it's uh, got all the elements in it. Kids Green Topol is bringing us back to being one with our supernova, being one with our land. Wouldn't it be amazing in 10 years time to see this sort of program rolled out across New Zealand with lots and lots of our children in Tamariki involved in nature, learning alongside each other, 
learning alongside community partners and learning alongside our children. So um, I shared that with you to um, give you an idea of the sort of work that they're doing in Topo around that project. And um, the um, website is there if you want to explore more. Um, I've chosen another project from New Zealand because this one here is a skills training organization, the Papa Tayo Earth Care. And what, they've do, what they do in this particular organization is they put together skills about caring for the environment with enterprise. And they're teaching youth skills that, they can, that are related to environmental issues that they can go out and use and get a job. And you can see here at the bottom, I've got the, um, the goals that are involved in this project and I've got reduced inequalities. And the reason why this program incorporates that goal is that this, these pro courses are run in areas of New Zealand with very high unemployment, particularly youth who um, drop out of school, they don't finish their education, and then they've got nothing to do. And of course, they you know, can get into trouble. So this particular organization is teaching these youth and giving them some skills so they can go and get jobs um, so that they can lead more productive lives. So they actually um, put them through a program where they get accreditation for the job market. And as you can see, they work in partnership with industries, like they work with farmers, they work with government departments, our Department of Conservation and other community groups. And here's an example of one of their programs and it's called Why Restoration. Why means water. Now, in New Zealand, you may know that we've got a predominantly agricultural economy and we've got a lot of cows. And we also have a lot of waterways like streams, rivers and that sort of thing. And um, the problem we have with our cows is scientists have found that cows are something like 40% more likely to urinate in a waterway than they are in their paddocks. So we get very degraded waterways. So the... Um, Farmers are encouraged to fence off their waterways and plant them with, um, plant the riparian region with um, the appropriate plants. So this particular course takes these students through how you fence properly in a farm. So they teach them how to fence and do make electric fences, how to put up wire fences. And you can see this picture on the right. There's um, a girl there putting a fence post in using a spirit level to make sure that it's straight to build the wire fence. And then they also learn about the tools they use for fencing, how to maintain them. And then there's also horticultural skills of how to grow plants from cuttings and how to nurture them and how to care for them. And so these students come out with these skills so they can go and work and contract themselves out as fencers on farms to farmers and um, get gainful employment. So now what I've got is some examples of best practice from around the world, these programs that embed sustainable development goals into them. So first of all, we're going to Canada. And Canada has a, this particular student action for a sustainable future program, and they're covering these six goals. And you can see it's for grade five to eight students in the province of Saskatchewan. Um, Saskatoon is the biggest city in that particular province. And you can see here that element of partnership. So they've got schools, they've got non-formal educators, local governments involved, and it impacts on all areas in their communities. And what these students engage in is action and inquiry projects into these particular areas. They look at waste, they look at water and energy, they look at food production, biodiversity, and transportation. And at the end of each year, the students have a showcase event where they celebrate their achievements. And this is the sort of thing that they do. 
So they carry out classroom audits where they actually monitor and track their waste that they produce from year to year so they can track whether they're reducing it or not. Same for their water usage and energy usage. So they have things like school-wide lights out competitions. They look at ways of growing vegetables and microgreens in the classroom. And the picture I've got there on the right shows one person's inquiry project into how cities can grow their own vegetables. You know, because this is an important thing. A lot of energy goes into bringing um, food into a city to feed the people. You can see they also look at setting up composting and recycling systems in terms of energy, building solar ovens, using LED lights. And in terms of transportation, things like making sure there are non-idle areas outside the schools to improve the air quality. So they haven't got cars waiting outside the schools with their motors running. Now, this next one is set in Swaziland in Africa. And you may be aware that there's this international competition every year, the Zayed Future Energy Prize. And this particular college in Swaziland won this particular prize in 2015. And what it involves is schools putting together a sustainability and renewable energy plan, and you present it to this, um, the, for this prize. And if you win, you get the money to fund and implement your plan. And this particular school won. And you can see at the bottom, the sustainable development goals that are involved in their plan. The problem in Swaziland, as you can see, is as a nation, their electrification rates are very low. So they're relying on energy sources like kerosene heaters and stoves, which aren't particularly good for um, the um, environment um, because only less than 33% of the people are actually connected to the grid. So um, this particular school wanted to become energy secure and they wanted to become more carbon neutral. So one of the things they included in their plan was putting in a wind turbine and also um, some solar photovoltaic plants. And this was part of a larger energy generation and storage plant in their community. So on this next slide, I've got some images and you can see the person on the left um, they um, also invested in energy monitors so they could monitor their energy usage. They also invested in more LED lights to reduce the energy consumption. And then the picture on your right shows the wind turbine that they installed so that they could generate energy um, you know, with um, no carbon footprint. Now we're going to Taiwan. And what Taiwan has done, and I really envy that particular country, because what they've done is made environmental education as part of their curriculum, um, and every child studies environmental education. And the reason I envy them is because it's not the way in New Zealand, and that's what I'd like to see. So what Taiwan have done is it's part of their national curriculum framework. And what they've targeted particular sustainable development goals for their students' learning. And you can see them along there. So you can see they're particularly interested in responsible consumption and production and climate action. And um, they have got four, um, environmental education is one of four priority educational issues in their education system. And they've built this new curriculum by um, creating partnerships, both within schools and within the government and outside the government. And they've even consulted the public about what they think their children should be learning. And even more importantly, if you're going to make your environmental education plans work, is they've developed teaching plans and materials for their teachers. And what's really interesting about their um, curriculum is their curriculum has five overarching themes. You can see them here, um, ethics, sustainable development, climate change. And what you may or may not realize is Taiwan is very um, prone to earthquakes and they've had some very bad earthquakes there. So disaster preparedness is part of their environmental education as well as sustainable use of energy and resources. 
And what they've done with their theme is um, they've divided their schools from grade one to 12 up, and each grade grouping has a particular, particular concepts to learn under each of those themes. So what it means is that there is a spiral curriculum, and as the children go through school, their understanding of these themes deepens. And what's even more impressive about Taiwan is they've evaluated their um, environmental education practice. And what they found was that um, while the children knew a lot about the environment and they were aware of it, they needed to um, promote the teaching of environmental values, skills and actions so that their students actually went out and um, um, and did some, um, took some actions to mitigate and to um, solve some of the issues they were facing. So, so you can see um, there's a lot of children there riding their bikes to school that would tie back into use of energy. Now we're coming to the United Arab Emirates. They have taken a different approach. They don't have a national curriculum. Instead, they have um, an initiative, a program that schools can use, and it's called the Sustainable Schools Initiative. And what it's designed for is to reduce the United Arab Emirates' ecological footprint. And like Taiwan, they wanted to shift their learners from environmental awareness to actually taking action. The third bullet point shows the types of skills and thinking they're wanting their students to develop. You know, very much those 21st century learning skills, you can see critical thinking there, like I mentioned before. And so as part of this initiative, every school assess their impact, their environmental impact, and then they go about designing ways of lessening their environmental impact. So the students engage in school-based activities and in, in action, and they also go out into the community. So in this way, they are engaged in experiential learning, you know, kinesthetic learning that I talked about. And there's also teacher development involved, which is another key thing for um, being able to implement new programs. And along the bottom, you can see the SDGs that are focused on in the United Arab Emirates Sustainable Schools Initiative. You know, for example, you can see it's a bit different here because they've got clean water and sanitation. And their program has been evaluated and they've found that they've, they're having a um, very successful engagement of teachers as well as students. And the teacher's practice has changed. So the teachers are teaching from a more interdisciplinary disciplinary point of view, like um, a more holistic view. And then they're also incorporating more problem solving approaches. They've also found their curriculum has become more enriched because they've got up to date key information about current issues like climate change included into their curriculum now. The students feel more empowered and they feel like they're able to take action and make change. The community, the stakeholders are becoming more interested in what the students are doing. And this whole um, initiative has created this new forum that teachers and um, educators and students and the community can talk about issues and take action. Now we're moving to the USA and I chose this one because it's a really good example of another um, particular um, SDG, that of good health and well-being. Now what's happening, this, is, this program is set on the West Coast in San Francisco and it's a community-based organization that's very concerned with the health and well-being of particular ethnic groups that live in the States, Pacific Islanders and Hispanic and African American people. And what it does is it goes around to different high schools and engages high school students in one to two day programs where they learn about air quality. Because um, a lot of people die around the world every year because air quality is so poor. And so they teach these students how to monitor the quality of the air around their school and in their community. And then they come back to um, visit either the classes or clubs that schools might have set up, like an environmental club, 
where they continue the learning and they teach the children um, actions that, about actions that they can take to improve the air quality around their schools and in their communities. And the key aspects of this particular program is that this program is connected to the students' everyday lives. It's an issue um, that these um, students face every day. You know, the quality of the air they encounter when they walk out their classroom, when they're walking to school or going down to the local shops. And you can see here a picture of the students with the air quality monitors. And so the learning is very much centered around them, teaching them the skills to go out and carry out the monitoring. So it's hands-on investigations in a learning environment, their learning environment in the school, in the community. They're building skills, and through their skills, they're taking civic and personal responsibility because they're trying to change and um, solve this issue of the poor air quality. And really importantly, if you're going to do work like this, you've actually got to connect it to the educational standards in the school. Otherwise, um, teachers won't want to teach this type of program and it'll be seen as an add-on or an extra that they just don't want to do. And there's a huge amount of collaborators in this program. They've got a technology company on board, for example, who supplies the monitors and the software to be able to um, map the air quality. They've got a health advocacy organization to help them with um, advice. They've got experts, they've got um, parents, and of course the educators. So this, you know, um, this program's working really well. And to finish off, I don't know if you know this one, but in India, your country, you have got this amazing train. And what it does is it goes from round, um, round India spreading the message about climate change. So I don't know if you've heard of the Science Express Climate Action Special. So it's a, a mobile science ex um, exhibition that's run by your Department of Science and Technology. And what it's got is it's got 16 coaches on this train which also have the solar photovoltaic cells on their um, roofs to be able to generate their own power. And it travels around with the aim of educating people about climate change and the sort of things that people can do to mitigate for climate change. And it's the most visited mobile science exhibition in India. And you see, you know, 16.2 million visitors. And here at the bottom are the SDGs that it deals with and covers um, when you go and visit the train. So here's a picture of some school children visiting the train. And the reason why um, it's very successful is that it's got these partnerships going. It's got public and private sector partnerships on board to um, help you know, um, fund it. And also they continuously improve the um, types of exhibits and the learning that's involved on this train. And they've also researched the effects of people visiting it. And you can see here there's increased understanding about the um, facts, the scientific facts about climate change. There's also increased understanding about the impacts of climate change and possible solutions that we can take. There's increased understanding of the types of actions that people can take and a willingness to act, because that's really important. You know, it's one thing knowing about what you can do, but it's actually wanting to go out and do it that makes the difference. Just um, um, to finish off, there's something else we really need to consider as educators, is that our youth are facing incredible challenges for their future. I mean, you know, last year it was only, if you can say only, climate change. But now they've got a pandemic as well, which is going to adversely affect our global economy for years. And as a result of them looking ahead and thinking about their lives, many of our youth feel really helpless and they feel anxious, you know, about what's going to happen and very pessimistic. So as part of our teaching and part of their learning, we have, as educators have to think about how we can foster hope, how they can think more optimistically about their future. And so the sort of things you can do um, are like when you finish your lessons, making sure that you finish on a positive note. And 
practicing gratitude, I was introduced to this a couple of years ago. And when I first thought about it, I thought, oh, for goodness sake, you know, how is this going to help people's mental well-being? But it is a very, very well-researched strategy for improving your mental well-being. And it's thinking about what you're grateful for each day. Another way of fostering hope is having your students um, looking and studying what others are doing to manage. You know, what, are, what sort of things are they doing that are successful and particularly other children or other learners of their age. So it's like a role model. So here, for example, we could think of like, for example, Greta Thunberg and her um, mission about um, school strikes for climate. Le having students learn about how to take action, how they can make a difference. So it's building their agency and then people working together on projects to make their community more resilient. So all of these are ways um, that you can include your, in your programs that include the SDGs to help students feel more hopeful and optimistic about their future. So in summary, when we're thinking about embedding us these sustainable development goals, it's not only the issue that we're teaching, it's how we're teaching it, so that we go beyond just learning facts about the issue. We're encouraging environmental values, we're encouraging um, attitudes and action, and we're learning, action, teaching about action taking skills. So, what we're doing is developing their agency so they feel they can make a difference. We need to think about fostering hope and also consider, as you can see, as I've gone through these examples, the sustainable development goals that are more appropriate and more easily incorporated into formal education and others that um, just don't that haven't don't seem to feature so um thank you very much for your attention i hope that you've found this tour around the world and the um, programs they're doing of interest and um, we've got time now for questions Thank you, Dr. Sally, for that enlightening session. And uh, now the session is open for questions. You can post your questions in the chat. Those who have questions, those who have questions, please post your questions in the chat box. Father Roy, can you put the question in the chat box? Um, I could stop sharing my screen. Yeah, do you want to do you want to stop sharing the screen now? Yeah, yes, you can if it is. Yeah. Oh, we've got um sixteen. Are there any questions? <laughs> we don't see any questions in the chat box. I think you, were, you had explained it in so much in detail. If you want to ask any questions, you can either start your video and show your hand. So the admin will see you raise the hands. Otherwise, you can post the question in the chat box. Yes, Prakash AG, uh, admin, can you unmute Prakash AG? So, uh, good morning, all of you, and I'm very happy to see a very vibrant host today. This is the third uh, session. I am very happy to see that uh, your vibrant attitude towards the environmental uh, education and air quality workshops. So, one thing that I have identified, this is only just a perspective from me. Uh, I used to, to listen to CNN channel and I used to, to see the air quality uh, uh, pro, the status in different cities. But in India, I can't find even a single channel by which we can find uh, air quality status. And I can see whether uh, there will be rain and uh, whether there will be sunshine and all. 
but uh, this is uh, a great important thing that uh, most of the western channels are giving air quality mm -hmm. workshops and i appreciate for that my question is very simple the simple question is you know the environmental studies let me introduce myself my name is air and i am a principal of a school in tamil nadu and uh, environmental studies it is a subject which is there given to the classes from class 1 to class 5 but yes. when time goes by after sixth standard to higher education including the collegiate level of education environmental studies is not at all a subject so why can't the government of india have, can take a decision why can't university grant commission and the central board of education can make a decision that environmental studies should be a compulsory subject for all the students irrespective of the age groups this is my question i unfortunately it's up to countries to decide and the governments to decide what goes into a curriculum and this is the issue i face in new zealand is that environmental education is not compulsory it is up to individual teachers and individual schools from year one to year 13, whether they want to implement it or not. And there's all sorts of issues involved, things like some parents don't want to see their children do environmental studies because they want their children to study things like science and maths and English so that they can go to university and get good jobs. And what sort of job are you going to get if you do environmental studies? So there's so many issues. Um, you know, there's attitudes towards learning about the environment. There's the value that um, your government puts on that learning. And it's, it's varied all the way around the world, which is why I really liked Taiwan, because they've done it. So it really requires um, teachers, educators, and society as a whole to say to the government, no, we want all our children to do environmental studies all the way through school. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Admin, can you please unmute uh, Prakash AG, followed by Rujika Sharma, followed by Gayatri, Gayatri G. So they have questions to be asked. Prakash AG, Rujika Sharma, and Gayatri G. Yes, you can ask the question. I think Rujika Sharma, you're, you're being unmuted. Yeah, ma'am. Uh, Priya, ma'am, you are also co-host. You can also unmute them. Now, Ruchika Sharma, you can ask. Uh, good morning. Hi. So my question is, ma'am. Hello. Yes. Ma'am, can you hear me, ma'am? Yes. Uh, ma'am, Dr. Sally, ma'am, I just have a little small question regarding this STG, ma'am. How, mm -hmm. come, how can a non-formal educator contribute in STG in a school, ma'am? Um, I think that you need to work alongside your school and um, discuss with your school what kind of issue you could learn about um, in, your, you know, in your school community. And then when you look at your issue, like it might be, like remember I showed you that video about the kids greening topo. They want to um, restore the terrestrial ecosystem. And then when you work, discuss with your school and work out what you want to do, then you can think about which SDG you can work towards based on your discussion. So it's a partnership. So um, this type of learning, it's very sort of neat. It, it, it's very needs based. You look at your community, like your school, and think what do what do we need to work on to make things. Okay, uh, Oh, I can't hear. Oh, I wait, ma'am. I just wanted to ask you, ma'am. Uh, non formal. Hello, ma'am. Can you hear me, ma'am? I can now. Uh, ma'am, I just wanted to add to it, ma'am. Uh, as far as my understanding, the non-formal educator means those, uh, anyone from the community, ma'am, can help us in doing this in the school? Um, well, for me, my understanding of non-formal is um, we have organizations, you know, like the people that were teaching about the air quality in the United States. They're an organization who are able to go into schools and offer those kind of programs. 
okay ma'am okay ma'am ma'am another ma'am uh, just another query i had ma'am like we are talking about this sdg ma'am like most of the ib school ma'am i hope you are aware of it uh, this international baccalaureate ma'am all oh, of them has a yeah ma'am i am a pyp coordinator ma'am in an ib school ma'am so mm-hmm. whatever you were talking in the uh, uh, this presentation ma'am everything as a part of a curriculum we are doing it ma'am so yep. we yeah we do have exhibitions we do have uh, agency with our children students ma'am but mm-hmm. i feel ma'am it is very small uh, you know organization which has not been spread throughout the world ma'am we still need to have our normal local schools to have these kinds of um, you know ma'am strategies for sdg ma'am yes yes we do so like, yes ma'am so india doesn't have ma'am very few ib schools are there in india where we are having these kinds of uh, curriculum for primary level ma'am primary and middle school and the higher school so mm-hmm. i feel uh, there has to be some uh, you know changes in our curriculum in other local schools also so that such kind of a things can be you know ma'am uh, brought in and will really help the school ma'am that is what i feel ma'am yep um, i agree with you totally yep okay thank you uh, as we have more people for with the questions and uh, time is limited i think uh, admin i cannot mute unmute the other people can you unmute uh, gayatri amit mehra and uh, dr patmanabha otherwise you can post your questions in the chat session i think that works out much more faster Uh, good morning ma'am sally ma'am good morning uh myself mr amit and uh, i am from uh, india and i just want to pose a question to you uh, i am heading uh, you know uh, an environmental club in my school only okay. okay we are having an environmental club and we take a lot of activities related to environment mm-hmm. uh, but the major problem major challenge is that that we belong to a very hereditary uh, 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 india for example uh, and india is full of heritage we all know that so we took an initiative took a project to conserve you know walls heritage wall in our city yes. but there was a lot of resistance from the you know general public so yeah. they do not want to support me my students and my colleagues we all went out on roads uh, you know be, defacement is a major problem we all facing all the walls traditional walls you know all the city walls were full of posters full of you know oh, dirt right. and things we try to we try to remove them we try to persuade people to be uh, like more empathetic more mm-hmm. compassionate towards the environmental issues but the mm-hmm. major problem we suffered that from society there was a lot of reluctance Mm-hmm. so uh, mm-hmm. i just want to ask you uh, if i compare india with mm-hmm. new zealand you belong to new zealand such things happen in new zealand also like do you get a, a resistance from the general public and how do as an institution as a school we can uh, make our efforts more uh, you know more oriented toward our goal we tried our best you know our project mm-hmm. was initiated even by unesco also so yes. my my uh, simple humble request to you ma'am kindly give us some measures through which we can coordinate with the government agencies or some private institutions where we can take out these projects you know children are very very much uh, you know sensitive about these issues but what about the grown ups the adults they are very rigid they are not flexible they are not adaptive to the change so this yeah. environmental issues which we are facing here in our bald city is that lot of defacement of wall is being done and we took this project it's a practical example i'm giving but it faces a lot of you know problem in making the people aware know that is our city we have to make it clean we have to make go for this defacement project complete so mm-hmm. kindly tell us is there some agencies through which we can contact and take this project thank you ma'am um i i think it, it re- you've got to work at a local level on, on these particular issues and and this is the problem that we face with taking environmental oh. action is that not everyone is going to agree with what you want to do um and all you can do and it can be very depressing is is keep working away and trying to find um agencies organizations that are going to work with you because if you get enough of them on board it will eventually make a difference 
there's no easy one answer. There's no, I come, sorry, I can't give you an easy answer and say, go here and they will solve the problem for you or they will help you. You've just got to keep working away. You've got to find partnerships, people who agree with what you're doing and keep working at it. And eventually, attitudes do change. So I can give you an example. Um, in Auckland, about six or seven years ago, a supermarket chain tried to stop single-use plastic bags being issued at the checkout. And I mean, environmentally, it's an amazing thing and people wanted it to happen. But the problem is, a lot of people didn't want it to happen, so the supermarket had to back down. But a year ago, people had changed their minds. And so we now have no more single-use plastic bags at any supermarket throughout New Zealand. So it requires change to take place with enough people in society. And you just have to keep working away at it. And it can happen. I'm sorry I can't give you... a you know, a, an easy answer. They're very complicated issues when we start dealing with our environment and trying to solve the issues associated with it. And it takes a lot of work and it can be hard. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, there are many questions in the chat box. So I'll just oh, good, morning. good morning, ma'am. I'm Dr. Padbuna from Bangalore. I have a one straight question to you. Yes. 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 Uh, ma'am, my question is, uh, we are dealing with uh, SDGs in our school from past two years. We have a very limited area and I have children coming from all the backgrounds. How do we implement it effectively in our schools, which has got very limited area and limited resources and children coming from different backgrounds? You've got to search for some kind of issue or project perhaps located on your school grounds or um, something that's of interest to the students. Um, and see and go from there. Um, I know that um, our schools in New Zealand often look, you know, within the school grounds. I know of schools who do things like, for example, um, they grow vegetable gardens and they teach the children how to grow their own food. Um, they do things like they build um, sensory gardens or they make um, butterfly gardens to attract butterflies. Um, you just, I would go back to your children and ask, what are they interested in? What do they see as something they would like um, better in their school environment? I am aware that in New Zealand, we do have more school grounds than many other countries in the world do. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Let me interrupt you. I will just quickly read out all the other questions which are there in the Can chat box. This is referring to the environment where we stay, how to cope up with the community beside us. They are promoting more number of rubber plants, which is not supportable to the environment. That is question number one. Then there's another question. What is your take on complete lockdown for a certain period of time every year to have a positive impact on the world? <laughs> After, okay, we'll go with this and then we, we have yet another three, four questions. We will take it up after this. We have one more session by Dr. Jonas Richard after this. So maybe uh, we will make it a little short. Yes, ma'am. You can, can you answer the question regarding this lockdown period and... Uh, oh, um... <laughs> I have been on lockdown now for nearly 50 days, 5-0. Um, while I see a difference in um, my environment, um, I don't know if I want to be locked down all <laughs> every, um, every year. Um, I, I, see a, I think um, a lockdown has made us think about our world and what we do. And it's definitely had effects on the environment. I definitely noticed the air quality. Um, and I do notice the wildlife coming back. Um, so I do think in some ways having a lockdown makes us appreciate those things more, maybe appreciate each other more in our family. But it's got to be weighed up against everything else. And it really does highlight the complexity of issues. Is you know, we've got positive environmental impacts but it's also negative in terms of social impacts and also economic impacts. 
And somehow we need to find a balance between those three um, areas in our lives and what we do. And it's very, very difficult. There's no easy answers. Yeah, so I don't know the answer to that one. Okay, uh, one more question. As being a rural school catering mainly to the farmers, what mm -hmm. pick up an agriculture team and work around it and try to help them collaborate with the community? Can our children also have international collaboration with your children, doctor? I'm sure I could find a school that who would be interested. So if they would like to email me, I'll see what I can find for them because there's plenty of schools out there in rural communities who would be interested in communicating and talking about issues with schools in India. And how to make students focused on sustained learning rather than focusing on exam only? Does such projects help them and help in gaining knowledge? I think that is what you explained in detail today. Yes, um, and, and that was one of the um, things with that air quality example is making sure that the learning they're doing aligns with educational standards so that somehow what they're learning um, can form part of the exam. Because otherwise it, um, it, it's very difficult and there's that tension in this type of learning with having exams as well. And in some ways we're quite fortunate in New Zealand in that we do have examinations related to education for sustainability in um, our, that are credentialing exams to go to a tertiary education um, facility. So there's got to be alignment between your exams and what you do in the classroom. Yes. It just makes it more complex. Mr. Deepa has mentioned that in Nepal, they have this, uh, no, they have environment club and in their school curriculum also, they have environmental education. It is just mm -hmm. a statement, it is not a question. And uh, there is another one more question. Uh, yeah, the, any solutions for planning activities for large classrooms? Um, it, it just makes things harder. I mean, whether you do it, um, if you're going to have to have, if you've got very large classes, how do you get them all outside working on projects? Because you are going to need more support. You're going to need perhaps some parents or some more helpers to make sure that all the children are supervised. So it's one of these things that just makes things a little bit more difficult and you've got to put some more thought into how you can do that and strategies, or maybe you take a group out at a time. Um, um, you, it's all the logistics of working outside of a classroom that you have to think about. And then often there's health and safety considerations as well. So it's, some, it's a problem you've got to, another problem you've got to think through doing this type of education. One more last question. I think it's time for us to wind up. What do you say about the ideology of Greta Thunberg? Uh, I, I think that she is amazing. Um, I think that um, she has managed to mobilize youth and give them a voice to um, tell adults about their concerns, about their future. Um, and I know for myself, I mean, I knew that yeah, youth were really um, concerned about climate change and um, its effects on their lives. But her inspiration meant that many youth um, came out for that um, school strike for climate change rallies in my country. And then we invited the leaders to a forum to talk to teachers about what they wanted teachers to teach about climate change in our country. And why I regard Greta as such an inspiration is that when I saw one of the, the students in my country stand up and talk about her worry about the future for herself and for her family and start to cry, it really brought home to me how you feel about climate change and how concerned they are. So I am in awe and admiration of Greta and the way that she lives and, um, and follows her personal beliefs. Thank you, Doctor. It was, uh, it was we are all enriched with, the, with this wonderful session. You made us think beyond the box, what are things which we can do and which is the need of the art today. 
and uh, you know about you emphasized on like the existing education needs to be reoriented towards sustainability and about lifelong learning and about the sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems how to embed the sdgs the principles involved in and ideas about bringing green local com communities improving biodiversity and it was great to see you taking the case studies of each and every country how they have implemented is taking the case of new zealand australia canada uh, switzerland uh, swaziland taiwan uh, india and uh, we are very very happy to have you with us and enlightening us today thank you very much for your valuable time on behalf of krishna jayanti college management and iqsc and all the participants gathered here i express my sincere thanks for your valuable time here thank you ma'am thank you very much and i hope that people have got things to go away and think about thank you thank you thank you dr sally yes now we have the next session Uh, by Dr. Jonas uh, Richards and uh, participants, a wonderful audience listening keenly to Dr. Sally, and you adhere to every instruction. And only in the end, everybody had you know put up the questions in the chat session. I think we will follow the same protocol. Uh, it actually works out very fine. Everybody can listen carefully to the session. So uh, now we move on to the next session by. Dr. Jonas Richard, the session of today is promoting positive student mental health in schools. Dr. Jonas Richard, a has twenty plus years of experience in academia and industry with unique combination of expertise in the area of life skill training, social work education, and psychosocial support. A trainer by practice and an academician by profession, Dr. Jonas. facilitates regular sessions in the area of life skills education capacity building workshops and employee engagement activities he has trained more than 500 plus groups of participants on various dimensions of psychosocial wellbeing and stress management his training sessions are highly participative and impactful his phd work on life skills using quasi experimental design with pre post analysis was widely appreciated as mental health educator dr jonas trains parents and teachers on basic parenting skills family life enrichment programs positive student mental health positive discipline techniques psychosocial understanding and gen y learners handling social media addiction and providing psychological first aid Dr Jonas has published many research articles authored books and written chapters in books currently Dr Jonas Richard is the head of the department of social work and the director of the center for life skills education and center for continuous professional development in Christo Jayanti college sir very warm welcome and over you and over to you for the next session Okay, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, you are audible. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, 
Okay. Is my screen seen, madam? I have shared the screen. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, dear friends, thank you once again for your sustained interest. Yesterday, we just started with the introduction and went on to move on to the uh, different aspects of school education, especially on leadership. This morning, we talked about Dr. Sally from uh, Auckland, New Zealand, on how SDGs, Sustainable Development goals can be effectively incorporated in school uh, education now this session we would talk a uh, little lighter session but then very important session as principals how do we make our students mentally healthy and what is the role of principals in making uh, children who are mentally healthy what is the role that schools can play what is our uh, limitation? How far we can contribute? Is everything under control or do we also have our limitations? How far the teachers can be effectively deployed in making a school mental health program a reality? So with this background, I congratulate all of you for being here today because uh, roughly about one point Five million schools are there in India, 1.5, roughly 15 lakhs. Uh, out of that, I do not know how many participants we have got about uh, uh, close to 400. I don't know what percentage it works out to, less than one percentage. Some max teachers can uh, put it there in the chat. So less than one percentage of you who have taken a time and interest to know about the different aspects of school educational leadership so that our institutions become better institutions with this a uh, few words i would get away get inside my presentation uh, before i start there are uh, two things uh, friends the presentations that we share is the uh, collective and cumulative responsible uh, uh, what do you call responsibility and the expertise of our research team in krishna jayanti college we have a team of faculty members who travel across India to train different school teachers and students on various dimensions of psychosocial well-being. So the matter that we share is the cumulative expertise and the experience with all the schools, hundreds of schools and thousands of students and with their experience. And you're not, you're free to disagree and because true mental health is agreeing to disagree, okay? So we are not forcing our opinions, anything that you feel, because we value also your experience and expertise. With this, we get into this. As all of us know, this is the discussion track that we would be having it. We would talk about what is mental health, what is what ill health, and what is mental health, and why mental health is very important at school. We will also see how far or what is the limitation schools can play as far as mental health is concerned. And we will move on to what are the current concerns and challenges. As all of us know, working with the today's children is quite a challenge because today's children live in the best time of the history. Today's children live in the best time of the history. They also have equal amount of challenges whether it is psychological or a social or academic emotional they go through and we would end with some specific strategies that we can incorporate in our school education system that can promote positive mental health now there are some basic statistics we need to keep in mind before we understand today's children all of us know India is the second most populous country in the world with roughly about 1.236 billion uh, population. Okay, so with this population, and we know we are the second largest, and with this, every fifth person is a child or adolescent. Every fifth person. And between 10 to 19 years, and every third person is aged between 10 to 24 years. And this is the latest statistics. And roughly about 434 million 
children and adolescents in India are, are there. And which means we are the highest child population in the globe. At a given point of time, we have roughly about 50 million Indian children who suffer from minor major mental disorders. So friends, it is a statistics and quite serious one. Why I am sharing is that we need to understand with this background, what with our limited capacity, what we can do in our own schools. With the statistics, we also need to understand some basic realities, okay, and what we can do. The emotional, social, and psychological development of children has a direct impact on the overall academic performance of children. I'm sure as principals with a long experience, you all agree with me. It is not just the academic input, but the emotional, social, and psychological development that makes the child a really a fully grown or a matured adult. Now, who is responsible for this? Only the parents or only the schools or only the society? Yes, we need to discuss. And we also know by experience, children who receive maximum love and affection experience a very strong sense of security and they suffer from low self-esteem. All of us know, all of us have some sense of low self-esteem, less or more, and most of the time it starts at the school, especially at the late childhood, between the age of 8 to 12, most of our self-esteem issues start. Unfortunately, many a times this is not taken care at the school level. And we also know many a times the school classroom itself become the source of some sort of low self-esteem. Let us go back and think of our own life. One low self-esteem experience that we all had would have probably started in that age. And we also know children who face neglect and emotional abuse turn out to be the antisocial elements. We have a lot of issues and cases. Anybody who becomes a later on turns out to become an antisocial element, their root cause would be when they were children. Psychologists say it can even be the prenatal period. There is a case about uh, uh, Hitler. Hitler's mother tried to commit suicide three times when he was in the womb. You can imagine the uh, effect of parenting, even at the prenatal level, how it affects the psychosocial makeup of an individual. We'll move on. Now, this is the background how children develop positive or negative mental makeup. Now, what happens to the school when it comes? We know a happy teacher creates a happy, a mentally healthy and stable child. But whereas an unhappy teacher creates unhappy, a frustrated child, and which turns out it affects the other aspects of their psychosocial well-being. So therefore, dear friends, teachers play a very, very, very crucial role in developing the positive mindset of the learners. As principals, we may not be in touch with the students directly on a day-to-day -day basis. But whereas every teacher is expected to be like a bridge between the child and the principal or the child and the parent. But unfortunately, what we see in some cases is people, instead of becoming a bridges, they become walls. When teacher becomes a wall instead of a bridge, the child's psychosocial, emotional well-being gets completely hampered. Having said that, we know schools have a vital and crucial role to play in the promotion of child's mental health. Schools, we just cannot uh, do away the responsibility of providing the holistic development for the child. We cannot be only worried about only the academic performance of the children. So a holistic development also includes emotional and psychological well-being of the child. As we know, in 21st century, the roles are getting changed. Yesterday, Dr. Edward talked about the changing paradigm in education, how the entire concept 
of education moving from a government to want to a big private business is becoming changed whether we like it or not there are big players there as our missionary schools as our traditional schools we would have taken 20 years 30 years to put up infrastructure today the corporate houses are able to put a big uh, infrastructure within two years three years earlier our schools used to be known for two things teaching english and imparting value system let's stop here and ask are we still holding on those two usps in our schools it's a point to reflect moving on to the role of a teachers teachers role how it is changing over the years earlier teacher was like a sage on the stage most of us but today teacher is only a guide teacher is expected to be a partner in the learning process and earlier teacher was gospel truth today but today student has got much more reference point something called google or any online resources in a very jokingly on a lighter note we say earlier we used to have a mata pita guru devam but today we have mata pita google devam so google has become one of the major uh, uh, component that's why one line uh, one one liner i read somewhere it said respect your parents they passed eighth standard even before google came which means they are more intelligent today so with all these technologies teachers role also have to change earlier we enjoyed the respect for the position as a teacher just because somebody is a teacher just because somebody is a principal we enjoy a positive social image but today among the teachers people are classifying good teacher bad teacher good principal bad principal so it goes by person centered earned respect every day we need to earn our respect today that is the real current situation earlier we could boss over today with a lot of private schools we become a pay masters whether students say it openly or not students know it your salary is paid by my fees and that is the attitude that develops in many of the parents also on children now what happens when teacher does not create a positive relationship this attitude emerges and we move on to a customer is the king so whatever customer wants you give customer centric whether students can be considered as a customer that's a big question mark and it is a debatable and earlier as teachers we had we were role model today we have to find a role so dear friends this is the crucial this is one another interesting uh picture that i found recently how uh, the exam patterns have changed over the years very uh, very uh, jokingly they have put see in 1995 exam answer all the questions in 2000 when you come answer only five question 2005 select the correct answer a b or c and when we move on to the uh, 2010 we have only write either a or b and 2015 please read only questions now 2020 thanks for coming in coming in now with this uh, covid 19 and other issues i i don't know thanks for logging in because with the, all the online classes then students log in i do not do we really uh, make sure that people are really learning so therefore dear friends lot of things are changing we teachers also should change and most of the times what happens based on my little experience with the traveling with across uh, the other uh, schools and colleges many a time teachers think okay 3 year preparation 30 year reputation over my job so unless we renew ourselves unless as principals we make our teachers they say the best way to become a very good teacher is burn the last year's notes every year when the academic year ends if the teacher is burning out the notes they say the teacher will become an effective teacher so that no which means the teacher is expected to prepare more and update more now having said that let us look at some of the basic and essential imperatives for positive mental health which means if we want a positive mental health in our schools these are the basics 
that we need to keep in mind. Number one, promoting positive mental health is crucial to child's overall personality development. Mushrooming schools, coaching centers, many a times we see they ignore all the other aspects except mark, mark, mark. Many a times children are seen as mark producing ATMs. I have seen parents openly saying, do whatever you want. I'm not worried about your other aspects of your life. Get me so much mark. It's very sad. When we excessively focus only on mark, what happens once the child gets only mark doesn't develop. We have 101 example of uh, uh, what happens. All of us know the, the case of last year in um, Karnataka, we had this uh, uh, cafe coffee day, uh, the founder, I think his name was Trida or something. Okay, this person, everybody thought he is successful, but he did not feel he is successful. He was academically brilliant, and entrepreneurial wise, very intelligent, socially respected. Everything was happening, but he could not face the problems or the realities of life. But somewhere today, we see in our schools, children become very intelligent, no doubt about it. They get very good marks. What we have studied in 10th standard, today's children study in 5th standard. All that is okay. But what happens when problem comes? Frustration, tolerance, ability to face situations, how long they are able to face the problem. Small problem, they are not able to uh, face it. They easily give up. Or they immediately get into online and go for online frustration, online uh, ventilation. All of us know in the recent case, what's happening in our uh, capital uh, city, Delhi, uh, what is that called? Boys, boys locker room. Boys locker room uh, case. And where, you know, school children talking about, uh, you know, the violence and without any guilt feeling. So this is something dangerous. So as responsible uh, educational leaders, we have a serious role to play. So working on about themselves and how they look at the world is decides child's mental health. Two things happen when we talk about child's mental health. How the child looks at himself or herself, how he looks at or she looks at the entire world. So two, one is satisfying one's oneself, satisfying the society. This internal equilibrium, this social balance is what is required if we want to promote positive social mental health. And not exposing children to violence is the primary responsibility of the caregivers. Now, who are the primary caregivers? Parents and teachers. That is why we say parents are the first parent, parents are the first teachers, and teachers are the second parents. So these triangle relationship of parent, teacher, student, they need to have a constant communication and makes sure children are not exposed to violence. Because only when this happens, children develop to be a positive child. And another uh, aspect is unrealistic expectation. Many a times, uh, there is a popular case, a child which was brought to us for counseling. Uh, the parents came, a uh, ninth standard child uh, studying in a, a state board. The parents are saying, sir, my son doesn't open the book at home. This fellow is getting 98 percentage mark overall without studying. If he studies, he will get 100, but he doesn't study. Please make him study. As uh, mental health experts, we understood the situation. The problem is not with the child. Problem is the over expectation of the parents. We had to counsel the parents and say, the child has a unique learning style, which he studies only at the school. He does not have to come and open the books at home. His methodology of learning is only auditory learning. All of us know auditory kinesthetic, you know, the uh, video, VAK model. Now, this child was good at auditory at the school. So he was successful, whereas parents did not understand. Dear principals, dear teachers, putting pressure is not a problem. On whom we are putting a pressure is to be really decided. Even in our own institutions, sometimes 
teachers come with the complaint to the principal this boy doesn't open the books father he is very good in study but he does not put work he is very talented but does not work hard as i say some names may be popping up in your mind about your own students please have realistic expectations there are some authors who say unrealistic expectations is also an emotional abuse okay i do not know whether you agree with this and just uh, leaving it to your thought process okay and all of us know children will respond well with routines and rituals so one sure way of making mental health possible for children is creating a routine life okay today with the lockdown talking to parents and observing my own children people have gone to a new normal new normal when i say their sleeping time has uh, i do not know how many people have got up in many homes now it's already uh, 10 30 11 they go to late night bed they eat a time in a uh, whenever they want so the routine life is disturbed so as principals if we want to promote positive mental health in our schools let us stick on to the rituals rituals when i say daily practices and the routines and the world health organization very clearly says when uh, we say health it includes mental health kindly look at this uh, triangle i am moving my cursor we have a mental physical and social health when i say somebody is uh, healthy we mean the person is mentally socially and emotionally healthy if we are focusing only on social health or a physical health and mental health is not taken care the person is not really healthy now just look at these two recent news i am sure all of you are aware of uh, what is happening in our this is only one example the latest that i could find yesterday night in the website there may be so many, and you can have a local examples of what happens when children become the uh, initiators of violence okay this is a a, a very uh, a, what do you call in famous case that we are all discussing about in the capital city a group of students openly discussing about uh, you know all sorts of se sexual crime and without even uh, feeling uh, guilty about it so which means increase to violence online crimes online bullying cyber bullying and above all suicidal tendencies i am not going to get into the statistics of suicidal tendencies because today as you know we become technologically advanced we also have number of people attempting cases of suicide interestingly i also would like to share a statistics whenever there is a pandemic they say the suicide attempted rates are less i do not know what is the reason you can think about it the psychosocial reasons whenever there is a disaster people attempting for suicide is less probably these days the one of the plus points of a lockdown would be people may not be trying out the, the attempted case of suicide may be less and the depression anxiety and above all emotional vulnerability children giving up so easily so just to tell you how the emotional issues become it is increasing day by day increasing day by day problems that we did not see it as a problem when we grew up has become a major issue for today's children now why it happens specifically with the today's children we need to understand three important factors number one the personal changes that happen with the today's children for example biological changes today's children grow up fast especially reaching the age of maturity they put on weight fast because of the excessive foods and becoming you know what do you call stouter taller you know physically they grow up fast because with the so much of packed food it's like a floated balloon the moment you stop the food they become a, you know you know the normal one okay excessive biological changes and above all they go through i id crisis what we call it ic who am i that is why today's children get into hero worship and most of the online games you see if your children are playing 90% of the online game 
is related to shooting and killing okay so indirectly one message is very clearly given to the children if you want to live you have to kill somebody there is no win win model it is only a win lose model you see how slowly these type of messages are put into their subconscious mind this is about their personal now what happens when we come to the academics expectation from the parents over expectation i will just show you one slide look at this slide friends it looks very funny in one tree you have mangoes you have apples you have bananas many a times when parents bring their children to us for counseling this is what they say same boy has to become a doctor engineer lawyer how is it possible whatever the parent could not fulfill in his life when he was growing up those dreams are pushed on the children and as a result children do not really enjoy their life i know in many schools where they attach with the tuition centers from morning till evening that coaching this coaching neat coaching that is why somebody had beautifully written children move from tuition center to tuition center as a result they bypass their childhood very beautifully it is written they bypass their childhood suddenly they realize they have grown up without enjoying their childhood so this makes them to live a very very immature life and a life which is not socially sanctioned this is about the parents now what happens to the schools i am sure as responsible principals you will agree with me some schools what do they do in the ninth standard they filter okay they put only few students in 10th standard so that they do not want to have the uh, affect their results okay now what happens to these children they are put under severe pressure excessive pressure we went to one school in the month of february me and our team dr nelson and others i asked one eighth standard ninth standard boy in the month of march come on man why are you not smiling this boy said sorry out of syllabus so much pressure 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 academically oriented so the child really does not enjoy the the child and excessive to learn big big books now we have a personal pressure for the child academic pressure for the child what happens to the social and peer pressure all of you know okay when everybody is doing why don't you do it the children are forced okay what we call it a mass bunking or a mass copying or uh, i don't know all sorts of anti social work that can happen within the school environment if the teachers do not monitor the students properly so and media influence how media projects school children today it projects in a very very wrong way if you don't put on weight you are not healthy when only when you look thin you are healthy so all these amounts to a big challenge not only for children but also for parents and above all school authorities as principals all of you will agree with me our school may be enjoying a very good reputation in our own locality for 20 years 30 years 50 years one fine morning one disciplinary action is taken against the child if a teacher slaps a child you don't have to do anything tomorrow morning you can see your your school in the tv in a negative way the night the whole country will debate how teachers are cruel crucial or a cruel so therefore dear friends as children grow they also go through challenge and these challenges also become burden not only for children themselves but also for the parents and now you look at this slide friends this is very beautiful slide which talks about three basic influences as far as mental health is concerned okay a child can have a child is influenced on child is influenced on three basic one is the family family has a big influence on the child okay if the family is quarreling indifferent 
lot of comparison imagine if there are two children if the parents excessively compare with the child the child develops low self low self esteem a sense of insecurity and develops a critical and the child becomes negative okay and when the child is over protected again it is a challenge and when there is no difference between punishment and discipline when parents do not understand there is a difference between punishment and discipline okay when the child does not parent does not understand it affects the child and when we comes to the school this is very important for us please pay attention to this particular aspect teachers attitude play a crucial role in the positive mental health of the child dear friends that is why we always urge the school educational leaders you take care of teachers teachers will take care of the students this is one successful model that is being practiced in christu jayanti college you take care of teachers teacher will take care of the students so therefore teachers mental health is very important for a school's success school's branding and above all students positive and emotional well being and the type of teaching methods the amount of homework okay and again the punishment the strict discipline comparison partiality dear friends this is very important as a leaders i my request to you whenever there is any complaint from parents about the partiality kindly take it seriously let us not protect our teachers because this can hamper the child's best mental health the child will grow up as a negative unwanted and these are the children when they grow up they look for attention in a negative way friends everybody looks for attention when it is not given in a positive way they will take it out in a negative way and our schools should not be a place for helping people to develop this negative mindset about one's own self of course the third aspect is the neighborhood the public their uh, friendship circle the truancy the gang activity smoking drinking and all sorts of unwanted issues that can come but i would request you to focus more on within our limitation within our current context within our given setup within our own campus how best we can promote positively the mental health our mentor father joskuti always used to say schools should be the best place for children to like to come teachers should be the best people where children would like to come and interact and unless we create that environment of uh, you know uh, ownership wanting welcoming we may not be able to achieve the bigger goal of positive mental health in our children and another aspect that we see in today's children the major reason for poor mental health is the peer pressure any bad habit that starts with the peer pressure every child is good every child is good no child is bad all of us know when you admit the child is good what happens over the years either because the teacher is not able to monitor or the parents both the parents work where making money becomes their priority than to spend time with the children and they get into the negative influence and these negative influences start with the peer pressure and excessive stress you know stress 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 today's children go through a lot of stress compared to our own life whether it is academic whether it is a social or, or whether it is with their own personality today's children go through a lot of personality issues you know uh, the uh, intention to look good better want to keep up their shape okay so all these hampers okay now what happens the other issues exam pressures excessive social media in fact we have a, a, a clear training set up in christu jayanti college where we train uh, teachers on how to handle social media addiction that's a big issue and today i do not know what's happening with our own children with all this uh, lockdown and interestingly uh, you know there was one uh, whatsapp uh, forward which i read a child is putting up a meme the schools said keep the mobile away but today the same schools are saying take your mobile we want to conduct online classes okay
it's a very joke but what happens limited So, how do I intake the information depends on my mental will. How do I output the information? How do I respond to the changing situations around me, unrealistic expectations around me? When a situational demand comes, unnecessary stressor comes, how do I respond depends on my emotional health. And when we say emotional health, we mean expressing emotion in a positive and in a socially sanctioned way. We need to underline the word socially sanctioned way, dear friends, because emotions are common to everybody. Emotions are common to everybody. All of us experience emotion, but how do we express the emotion? How we express the emotion decides how emotionally intelligent I am, how emotionally healthy I am. The best way to express emotion is in a way that is approved by the society. Society does not approve all sorts of expression. There is a certain way only we can express our emotion and that if the child is given, we can say the child is an emotionally healthy child. And we also have something called emotional regulators. Emotional regulation means ability to recognize, express and modulate one's own emotion and it is a very important aspect of mental health. And finally, we talk about two types of emotions. Generally, there are two types of emotions. As educational leaders, we need to be aware of it. One is a primary emotion, another one is secondary emotion. Primary emotion means there are four emotions are called primary emotions. They are called fear, anger, sadness, and happiness. All human beings experience these four emotions. We call it a fash. Fear, anger, sadness, and happiness. Even a newborn child experiences these four emotions. Now, secondary emotions are we experience based on how we interpret the primary emotions. For example, suffering, disappointment, shame, guilt feeling loneliness, all these are called secondary emotions because whatever that happens to me is a primary emotion. How I process that information and start feeling it, that becomes a secondary emotion. In my opinion, if we are able to take care of primary emotions properly within our own school environments, because we have limitations within four walls, we cannot work miracles. 
children are with us only to 6 hours or 5 hours and parents have got a role to play media has got a role to play we cannot accept full responsibility but we have to do our best so that children experience lots and lots of positive emotions now what happens or what decides a child's mental and emotional health in our own school environment the first one classroom management dear friends classroom management has got a proportionate importance or proportionate growth related to the overall academic performance of the learners as well as the school ranking when we want the best results we are focusing on the classrooms when we want the best children we focus we need to focus on the classroom the emotional climate in the classroom how the child is experiencing emotion within the four walls generally we talk about two types of climate one is a healthy emotional climate another one is a unhealthy emotional climate now what happens in a emotional positive healthy climate the child is relaxed very cooperative happy and motivated and child wants to learn now with this crowd we can have less rules and regulations because the child is voluntarily and happily and motivated to learn now what happens when there is an unhealthy climate unhealthy emotional climate which is largely and predominantly decided by the teacher's emotion the child is tensed how many times we have heard the cases of when the teacher is happy student is also happy all of us as principals as a teachers we all know when we grew up as a children we all liked the subject and those subject where we also liked the teachers if we like the teacher we also like the subjects that's how we all grew up so it also same with the today's children how can teachers make themselves likability likable to the children of course in a positive way but today there are a lot of unhealthy way of making a children like you i am not talking about it i am talking about positive and right and ethically motivated way how we can make the child like us when there is unhealthy climate children become nervous irritable hypercritical disinterested in subjects and they are the trouble makers i request you to think in all your classrooms there may be 10 percentage or a one boy or a one girl who is a real trouble for the teacher you go back and look at that child probably the child was very good in the beginning over the years when the child experienced unhealthy emotional climate either in the classroom or at home the child becomes the negative that is the first one second one what happens or what decides the child's emotional climate it is the teacher's personality dear friends if you notice again and again i am talking about the teacher's personality and teacher's psychosocial makeup teacher's emotional stability teacher's mental stamina all that decides because teachers really how many times children's language changes because they want to imitate the teacher you know the language the slang the way they walk sometimes small children do that sometimes even if the parents say this is right child will say no 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 my miss told this is only is right so that is the influence a teacher has on the child so therefore dear uh, educational leaders teachers personality is very crucial in deciding the child's positive mental health that is teacher's attitude teacher's attitude towards learning teachers attitude towards in coming up in life teachers do towards working at home if the teacher herself or himself comes to the class as a burden how do you think the child to stay motivated if the child teacher himself or herself is experiencing a sense of low self esteem unwantedness uncared for neglected definitely it will pass on to the children so therefore teachers emotional involvement is very very important the third aspect which decides a child's mental health in our school is 
the type of discipline we use generally we talk about four types of discipline one is what we call it authoritarian that is a one way discipline just to do what i say authoritarian okay or we have the other one is second one democratic authoritative where two way communication is given rules are explained whereas in authoritarian no rules are explained i am a teacher you are a student i am a hero you are a zero just listen to what i am say in such situation children may not talk to us openly they go to the online they start doing all type of cyber bullying or they express their emotions among their friendship circle in a inappropriate way it not only damages the school's branding and also the child's psychosocial makeup so therefore the type of discipline is very important i will talk about it little later and explain which type of discipline we need to use it okay and third one is what we call it a permissive discipline or a no discipline a teacher imagine in a classroom no rules if you want to come you come if you want to go you go if you want to sleep you sleep but only say that i am the best teacher imagine if we have one teacher like that in our school what type of mental health he or she can imbibe or contribute in the lives of these children so therefore dear principals we need to keep in mind these three important determinants of what happens to child's mental health one what happens within the classroom what happens within the personality of the teachers third one how schools handle disciplinary issues now having said that we will move on to some suggestions i am not getting into too much of a problem okay problems will always be there we need to think of solutions okay first one think of effective psychological first aid system we all know about normal first aid okay we need to have emotional first aid i am sure we all have a counselors in schools i do not know if uh, is there in the part of i think cbsc has prescribed and i have seen in some icsc schools or in ib schools in bangalore or in the other parts uh, delhi i have uh, when i visit the two schools or andhra three schools i have talked about it and i have also seen there are school counselors now these people are people who can give emotional first aid or a psychological first aid even every teacher can be trained okay and krishna jayanti we have a module exclusively on training teachers on how to identify a slow learner how to identify a children in crisis how to identify a child who needs more emotional support so the first suggestion is provide psychological first first aid second one is talk about mental health openly many a times what happens in schools there is a problematic child the class teacher is not able to handle she takes to the coordinator coordinator is not able to handle she sends her sends the child to the principal principal is able to handle or not able to handle finally the child lands up with the counselor now what happens when a child goes to the counselor there is a stigma attached oh, oh you went to counselor you had some mental health issues some problem i have heard in some schools children saying you take me anywhere even to the principal and again and again don't take me to the counselor going to the counselor has become a negative and stigmatized as we all need a physical health check we also need to check our emotional and mental health so we can talk about it openly in our assemblies in our uh, school programs okay even when we send a circular maybe a one small line one particular paragraph about talking about mental health and remove the stigma physical health we need we also need emotional health we all nobody is perfect we all need help the moment somebody thinks that i am really fully matured i think probably that person does not have a place here because we are all simple people we all need a emotional and psychological health and help and the next one is very important dear principals very important on life skills education who has come out with the 10 skills as life skills 
now what do these skills teach these skills help people to live a happier life not just to make a living but to live a happier life and to enjoy without guilt feeling that's very important whenever i talk to school children i tell them you enjoy no problem tomorrow when you go back to your children when you go back to your parents will you tell that you did this and enjoyed you think about it anything that you cannot talk to your parents that this was your enjoyment then that is not a enjoyment which means you are enjoying with guilt feeling can we make our children have a enjoyment without guilt feeling can we help our children to make right decisions now these life skills very quickly i will uh, talk about it there are 10 skills uh, uh, who talks about it self awareness empathy creative thinking critical thinking problem solving decision making coping with the emotions stress management communication and interpersonal relationship these are very 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 important skills crucial skills life skills so if you can make life skill education as part of your curriculum i think cbse uh, one module is there but let it not be like any other subject to dealt like father uh, uh, my principal was addressing yesterday for the josh kutin in christ jayanti we train all our teachers and students on life skills every year when we open the after the reopen academic year first two weeks nobody talks about anything except life skills children are given life skills so that they are able to deal with everyday challenges so my invitation please think about whether you can effectively incorporate life skill education in your curriculum if you need additional support yes we can we are there now train the teachers on positive mental health as i have been saying if you train the teachers forget about students they will take care of it okay teachers should have a positive mental health and can we train our teachers on stress management can we train our teachers on work life balance most of our schools majority of our teachers are ladies who also play a crucial role as a homemakers at home okay so how they can effectively balance so that whatever tension that they have does not get affected with their teaching here and whatever we have a tension here that should not affect their family life whether we can think of a training program i invite you to think about it and friends let me also remind you children are not springboard to our emotions i will repeat children are not springboard for our emotions children are not there to ventilate my emotion i am angry on somebody i should not express on the children i am very happy with somebody children are not there to express my emotions this is very very crucial we need to take care of it okay and treat all the students same earlier also i talked about comparison partiality will kill the brand image of the institution and spoil or professionally spoil the life of the teacher also so can we teach our teachers to be impartial treat everybody equally so that the child feels emotionally healthy and finally balancing between protection versus preparation we need to prepare the child okay at the same time we need to protect the child we need to protect the child at the same time we need to prepare the child how do we balance it ships are very safe in the harbor ships are very safe in the harbor but that is not why a ship is made for ships have to sail in the sea but at the same time we also protect the ship can we think of that model of protecting children as well as promoting children this is a very important role to play now some more suggestions what is the difference between discipline and punishment punishment is the option yes it is the option but that is the last option please remember punishment is the option i am not saying no but that should be the last option and we talk about pd positive discipline positive discipline looks at the future whereas punishment looks at the past we punish somebody for the past whereas when we discipline we look at the future of the child as responsible leaders can we create a framework can we create a structure in our own schools 
how children how teachers can have a positive disciplining system do we have a sop standard operating procedure for disciplining can we have a very clear cut system what happens in some schools small mistakes are highlighted blown out of proportion when something very big happens nobody bothers about it everybody keeps their mouth shut now what do we call this system the child gets confused what is accepted in the school what is not accepted i do not know so therefore as a responsible leaders we need to create a constructive system pro student student friendly system of discipline and another one respect before you expect it's a beautiful no respect before you expect whenever you want to expect a child to do something please respect the child's child's individuality child's emotional makeup especially if we are dealing with the class 11 and 12 children we need to respect is the only key because our experience shows whenever you respect the child they also respect us whenever we do not respect they do not respect us back okay and another is connect before you correct i'm just putting lot of uh, uh, key words for you to remember tag lines connect before you correct yes you correct the child but before that you connect with the child how do i connect with the child let me become friendly with the child okay tell the child understand the psychosocial backgrounds okay then you advise and one small tip which we i use is whenever you scold a child whenever you correct a child use the child's name as often as possible it works out okay whenever you even when you scold say the child's name often and scold the child feels anyway i am remembered anyway i am in the mind of the teacher instead of saying you what is your name i don't know so that attitude already feels anyway i am uncared for i am unwanted element so the child's mental health issues start friends our little experience with the real love any amount of punishment you give children do not make a issue children accept it only when we are not properly motivated simply for the sake of punishing institutions and teachers get into issues so it's a very crucial area encourage not just praise encourage children motivate children don't just praise children praising yes but motivate them children want you to encourage them not just praise them and finally identify the belief behind behavior every behavior has got a belief behind it every good deeds bad deeds whether you or me anything that we do there is a belief system which promotes that behavior so whenever you want to punish the child first to find out why this boy or girl would have done that belief you study the belief then you understand the behavior this is one popular theory which uh, even uh, my uh, vice principal father agustin uh, talks about it this is called a margin theory now what do i mean by margin theory students are like this notebook i am just moving the cursor please look at it students are like this uh, uh, notebook there is a margin now what happens our role as a teachers or leaders is here small part and students are expected to be in a bigger space now what do we mean by margin theory don't get into their space okay and do not allow them to come to your place when you respect maintain this respectable distance i think lot of uh, uh, disciplinary issues mental health issues can be sorted out whenever i conduct a parenting skills workshop again i tell parents follow this theory yes our own children yes our own people but maintain a respectable distance when we maintain that children know their limitation children know their space okay do not get into their space everybody needs their own personal space and do not allow them to come into your space when we do that automatically we will be able to maintain a positive mental health among our own children now few suggestions i have given now what happens when you maintain a positive uh, mental health okay when we have a positive mental health we have children with enhanced life satisfaction 
Dear friends, at the end of the day, what you need is happy about our own life. Whether you are a principal or a teacher, parent, or anybody in the society, at the end of the day, I should be happy to live in this world. Now, many things contribute towards that, but one thing which mainly contributes is the positive mental health, life, life satisfaction. Improved resilience. What is resilience? The ability to come out of a problem quickly. How quickly I can come out of a problem? We all face setbacks. Okay? We all face setbacks. We all have issues. Okay? Can I use this positive mental health to come back? People with the positive mental health, they are able to come out of that problem. They don't just go through the problem, they grow through the problem. They don't go through the problem, they grow through the problem. Okay, that is why we say people with mental health, their comeback is larger than their setback. Okay, they develop a positive, uh, you know, mental stamina, they develop it. Then improved concentration in studies, lots and lots of research have proved people with the positive mental health they have done better in studies. Then another concept today in psychology, we talk about it, frustration tolerance. Now frustration tolerance is how long I can hold the frustration. Look at me friends, I am holding a water bottle. Now this water bottle, it's not only a half water, it's not full. It's not so uh, difficult to carry, but how long can I hold? Five minutes, 10 minutes, Half an hour, one hour, two hour. After two hour, my hands will start paining. Now my hand will pain, not because of the weight of this water bottle, but how long I am holding on to this water bottle. This is what exactly happens in child's mental health, dear uh, experts, dear uh, leaders. Issues may be small, how long they are able to hold on to it. Studies have shown people with the positive mental health, they are able to withstand their issues and challenge and come up, whereas other people are not able to hold on. And finally, positive mental health helps overall quality of life. Okay, so I have put a few pictures just for you to, you know, on a lighter note, just to look at it. See, whenever your child is irritating, don't yell, just keep calm and show how to respond. Let the child see whenever there is something going wrong, this is how I need to respond. Okay, this is one. Second one, see the situation of the parent. It's on a lighter note. Don't look for a very serious lesson in this. Children, how what all go through? iPhone, iPad, see the parent, I paid tension of the parents okay this is about the parents mental health okay and this is just yesterday this picture i saw it in my whatsapp okay parents are the primary caregivers and role models look at these two children are asking mom we need a haircut this person is saying i'm not mom i'm dad okay <laughs> this is about the quarantine and haircut this picture came okay i saw it, it is a you know something to i can connect we can show it so therefore dear friends Parents play a crucial role, but within our system, we can, how far we can make parents also effective, again, I leave it to you. And one sure way of teaching positive mental health is teaching gratitude. Okay, look at this child. What you have taken for granted is a lifetime dream for somebody. What you have taken for granted is a lifetime dream for somebody. If this message is very strongly consciously given to our children, definitely they develop positive mental health. So with all this input, I think we can create positively mentally healthy children who can remove this myth. What are these myths? More mark means more intelligent, wrong. Success in exam is success in life, wrong. Failure in exam is equal to failure in life and end of life. So can we change these messages? Yes, it is possible. And finally, dear friends, it is better to prepare and prevent than to repair and regret. Okay, 
as far as mental health is concerned it is better to prepare and prevent than to repair and regret in the end it will not matter if i am a perfect teacher it will only matter if i was there for them when the child needed me remember teachers 20 years later what children will remember is not what you advised but how you advised i'll repeat 20 years later what children will remember is not what you advised but how we advised so let us all join together and create a positively developed a mentally healthy children who are real assets to our institutions who are real assets to our own society thank you so much for your patient listening thank you over to priya ma'am Dear participants, uh, sir, thank you so much for that very thought-provoking session and with the examples and I, I am very sure that all of us could relate well into it, you know, when, which we can actually put into practice. And uh, now because we are running short of time, we just have five minutes time, we'd, uh, uh, we will just take up the questions which has come up in the chat. Uh, I will just read out the questions. Whoever has more questions can put it in the chat because we just have five minutes to wind up. So the first uh, question which was uh, put up was, can Google remove the value of a teacher by Kiran Jaraya? Uh, <clears throat> Madam, Google is technology. Technology is only a supplement, not a substitute. Technology is only a supplement, but not a substitute so google cannot replace the teacher but teachers have got a higher level of roles to play earlier teachers yesterday also i think dr edward talked about it google can give information but google cannot motivate teachers may not be able to give the updated information but whereas teachers can motivate when a child is feeling lonely so therefore, Google cannot be uh, replaced teachers, but technology cannot replace the teachers. But teachers with the technology will replace teachers without the technology. So the technology is needed for teachers, but on a different level, we need to motivate students, not just give information. Google is only a information giver. Google cannot motivate. Okay, madam. Thank you, shall sir. Shall we ask questions, madam? Uh, shall I ask question? Because I raised my hand and I ah, have one. Okay, okay, you can. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, good morning, and Dr. James Richard. Uh, the guidance Jonas that Richard. you have. <laughs> okay, Jonas fine. Richard. Okay, Jonas Richard, and the guidance that you have provided in this webinar, especially during these uh, distressed times of COVID, was found to be very excellent. And let me appreciate first. Let me introduce myself. I am Prakash Nair, and I am a principal from Tamil Nadu. My question is very simple. Uh, you have given a very valuable point. A teacher should always be creating the bridges and not the walls. So my yes. question is, during the social distancing time, whether the teacher is creating walls or whether the teacher is creating bridges? This is my question. OK, so there are two points. Uh, first of all, uh, I do not agree with the term social distancing because it is only a physical distance. Okay, because as teachers, we cannot socially distance, we can have a physical distance. That uh, clarity on that. Second one is teachers are bridges right now. Teachers are uh, really bridges. And in fact, uh, see, there was one one liner WhatsApp message which came. One child is saying, Mams are better than moms during COVID. Mams are better than moms. Now, maybe a joke, but what the child is trying to say is, though I am away from my teacher, I would like to be more close to the teacher, though there is online class. Though I am always at home, excessive uh, disciplinary measures at home. Okay, so teachers are real bridges right now. I know the amount of uh, emotional help 
teacher many teachers keep calling us sir how do we deal with this situation this child feels this so sir teachers are bridges okay and they are doing a wonderful work during this covid 19 our salutations thank you sir okay, one more question sir how can we help a child to maintain a positive mental health and positive behavior towards his or her peer when he or she is being abused at home or observing that kind of actions at home yes madam this is a million dollar question because the child is with us for 5 hours 6 hours we do all sorts of it is like giving a bath to the child at home again this fellow is going and again uh, playing with the mud again you give a bath again the child is going out to play it is like that so what we can do as schools is identify the child's psychosocial background and the family situation give lots of attention i strongly believe if the teacher is taking personal attention whatever that happens at home will be compromised with what happens in the schools definitely we cannot change the situation at home definitely not because there are our own social restrictions but teachers love guidance comfort can definitely change the child it is possible it is possible okay now uh, dr sol no nicolas have uh, written i have a question and suggestion i feel all training on positive mental health is needed more for teachers starting with principals and parents than students what is your suggestion on this what is it madam uh i i feel all training on positive mental health is needed more for teachers and parents starting with principals than students what is your suggestion excellent excellent uh, dr sol is a, 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 a trainer and he conducts lot of trainings from pondicherry i appreciate as a very thought provoking question uh, dr sol nicolas any change that does not start with the leader will not change will not sustain it's a hardcore reality any change as a head of the family if i am not doing it myself my children will not follow it any change that does not start with the principal or a teacher it will not go down one simple example i will give you most of our schools have got a rule about a mobile phone usage supposing as a principal okay or as a teacher i have a rule that there is no mobile phone usage in the classroom as a teacher if i am using mobile phone the students may not react to us immediately but what message it goes once i am a leader i can do whatever i want so the change will not sustain change will not go so therefore uh, dr sol the change has to start with the leader it has to start with the principals it has to start with the teachers seeing us children will automatically change need not worry about it that's a very good question sir yes doctor yes thank please. you sir now rada nayar how much online session can be beneficial for the students how the student teacher bonding will get okay okay right how much bonding is online madam how far is too far it is the individual teacher to decide and the student to decide because lot of online counselings are happening it is very effective than the uh, you know offline counselling because lot of anonymity people feel more comfortable to speak all that but nowadays this online classes that is happening how serious the teacher is how serious the learner is i mean it depends on the case by case because there is no one solution but too much of anything is good for nothing but today you, you tell me honestly people have saturated about webinars okay the moment you talk about zoom that is another uh, fear word that is getting created so somewhere you need to strike a balance yes ma'am okay from rujika sharma what is it one quality a leader can suggest to become a happy teacher what is the one quality one quality a leader can suggest to become a happy te happy teacher one thing that i can suggest to you is that that is there is a more than one thing to become a good teacher okay it is not a one quality lot of things teachers mental makeup teachers psychosocial well being okay there are 10 qualities we talk in life skills if a teacher possesses all these 10 life skills i am sure the teacher will be a happy teacher there are two types of teachers generally we talk about all our trainings the first type of teacher 
who brings happiness to others with his or her presence second type of teacher who bring happiness to others by his or her absence very simple whether i bring happiness to students by my presence or by my absence decides how effective i am very simple but all that i can say is if you are personally happy you will make the classroom happy if you are personally unhappy hell for learners okay so there are two more questions we'll wind up after this as long as the children from prakash ag as long as the children are under the custody of teachers more time than with the parent shall we call teacher as a first parent yes we we can call but then legal implications are there we cannot call somebody's child as our own uh, uh, child eh? but in, in uh, what do we call it tomorrow dr sendel will talk on about the uh, finland model finland model school education is teachers are the final authority once the teacher says don't come even headmaster cannot enter the class that is the power teacher has got yes teacher is the may not be the biological parent but has got a strongest influence on the child that's a very good uh, uh, suggestion sir i value it okay so we'll go with the last question because the time is not permitting from sunil bakare what about the screen time effect on the psychological mental status of a child are we not imposing the online monotonous way of teaching on students in spite of their willingness and liking yes yes madam i i fully agree with you i am a person uh, uh, you know who is not for too much of screen time because in a social media addiction handling social media addiction when we conduct a training program 40 minutes before going to bed the child is not expected to have any social time any screen time as soon as you get up in the morning if you are looking at your social media it is a clear sign you are addicted to social media as soon as you look at whatsapp when you get up you are addicted to social media your social anxiety increases that affects your all aspects of your life so my suggestion is somewhere we have to stop and strike a balance screen time is not good imagine uh, once the lockdown is over when children report back to the school imagine how many children are going to have uh, eye issues how many children are going to uh, come with their you know this uh, spectacles so screen time yes definitely it affects i fully agree with you madam okay thank you sir uh, for that enlightening session on promoting uh, positive student mental health and you know to you had explained in detail about the role of teachers in emotional social and psychological development and you also stressed upon the points of the importance of emotional and mental health and the importance of life skill life skills education we are very extremely happy to have you with us dr john richard yes sir one one person has been kept on messaging that one question we'll just give them one chance yes, yes. sister yes. selina we'll just give her a chance okay okay that will wind up sister selina what is the question if you have question please type sister otherwise we'll move on because she kept on messaging also okay i'm not okay i think we seem to have lost no problem okay so dr jonas richard sir is a very popular uh, uh, no uh, faculty not only among the students but along with the faculty also in our te teacher community also because he is the one who coordinates and trains the entire krishu jayanti community whether it be the students or the faculty in life skills and his sessions are very very interesting and enriching and we get so much involved in the sessions and we have learned from him about the life skills and we teach our students uh, no and we give training to our students every year so thank you so much for your presence and your valuable time here sir on behalf of the krishu jayanti college and iqsc i uh, extend our sincere thanks and gratitude to you sir and uh, sincere thanks to all the participants who have spared their valuable time with us today now we will go for a break all of you can go have lunch and take a short nap if required because we will come back at 3 for the uh, 3 pm for the next session uh, dr gopakumar will be taking on content development skills with social media so we will wind up for now thank you for being there thank you
Amir sir. Dr. Amir. Amir sir. Amir sir. Ma'am. Yeah, Amir sir. Is... Uh, yeah, yeah. Please tell Amir sir to. Thanks. Mr. Mohan. Amir sir. Amir sir. Okay, maybe participants. Yeah, participants can leave the meeting. You can press the leave meeting icon on the right side below and leave the meeting. 